Wonderful. Hopefully you can all see this now. Cool. Get the pointer up. So we're going to be covering off a couple of bits and pieces today. Um, mainly we're going to be focusing around obviously the Facebook aspect of exactly what we're doing and how we're doing it. Um, we're going to do a little introduction on myself, a little bit around Facebook. We'll then do an introduction to Facebook pages, Facebook groups, around Facebook ads. And then finally, if there's any specific questions and queries that people have got, um, we'll then go through that in this final session. So to start off with, a little introduction. Um, my name is Zishan Malik. I've been in digital marketing for about 20 years now, having worked over 35 countries. I specialize in performance marketing. Um, my, the very first time I set up my company, a company was in 2008. It was called Digital Buddy. It was purely around digital performance uh, consultancy work. And then in 2017, I launched a new company called Yuya. Um, this is a specialist growth agency, which is focused around how to drive more revenue, more clients into your business as time goes by. We've got lots of people still joining in. Yeah. Right, so a little introduction for Facebook. Now, obviously, there's two parts of Facebook. You've got the personal side and then you've got the business side as well. The personal side we're not going to talk about too much because obviously you guys all have your own Facebook accounts. You all know how you generally know how it works. But the business part is the bit that people start to think about, right, how do I focus on this side of side of the business? Because it's fundamentally different in terms of the way that it works. So Facebook actually says that it is a social platform for businesses. It's a free environment for you to connect with people who are in your community. You do it all in the online space. And similar to your, to your personal profile, you're able to share um, images, videos, um, anything that sort of focuses around that structure of content you can push out. Now, a little bit about Facebook. It's been around for a while, we know that. It started in 2004, Mark Zuckerberg, we always hear about. Um, there's a revenue line of about $70 billion in, the U, uh, in USD in 2019. The business has got 2.6 billion users now, which is a huge number if you think about that in, to, in relation to countries and other social platforms that are out there. There's 18 million small business users. It reaches over 60% of the online world. And 65% and of the user base is still under 35, even though we think as Facebook as an older demographic. Obviously, if you compare it to the likes of TikTok or something like that, it's very, very different. 96% of access is actually done on a mobile device. So when you're thinking about your business and how to present it, you have to be mobile first. Otherwise, you end up in a position where you're not optimized for the target market. And people spend, on average, almost one hour a day online on Facebook. Hmm. Right. Let's talk about Facebook pages, which is the very first section. Still adding in. There we go. Now, what is a Facebook page? In essence, it's a public profile for your business. It's specifically created for brands, celebs, and causes and other organizations that can have a public face in the social environment. Now, unlike personal profiles, it doesn't gain a friend. It gains fans, which we all know about. So you get to like a page or you can follow it. Very quickly, there's three steps that you go through to create a page. It is amazingly easy to do it. Your business name and description, which is what you have to think about first. <clears throat> you enter it in and you have to make sure that it's something that's searchable so that when people are actually thinking about, right, I need to find this business. If you call your Facebook profile name something completely irrelevant or doesn't match your business branding, people actually aren't actually going to be able to find it, even though everyone always talks about Make sure you link it to your website and whatnot. A profile picture and a cover photo is a, rep is a branded representation of your business. It's a lot of times what people will remember. So that means you have to have something that represents your brand and represents your business. Most people, most companies use a logo for their profile. And then for the cover, they use something like perhaps of a shop or a marketing campaign or something that represents exactly what is happening within their world. Now, what is it you want people to do when, you, when they come to your page? You need to have a call to action. So just like all your other assets, be it your website or um, a mobile page or anything that you've got, you want people to do something. 
rather than just collecting likes, you need to think of it as when people come to my Facebook profile page, what do I want them to do? Do you want them to call you? Do you want them to access your website? How is it that you want them to interact with you? <clears throat> Once you've got it set up, what have you got to do? So obviously the first one is you need to start thinking about what content. So point one is to publish new content. Second one is start messaging, get involved with people, get, get conversations going. Third one is add special features. What we talk, what we mean by that is having um, filling out the services section, showcase your products. If you have a if, if you have a store that you, where you actually sell things or you have a service that you can provide, create a shop, add it in. Promote your page, invite customers to it, and then improve through data. Now I'm whizzing through this very very quickly, and the reason for that is because in each of these sections there's a lot of depth that we can go into, and we can talk about that at a later stage. But fundamentally, these are the five steps that you need to go through, and then you need to continuously repeat these five steps to make sure that every single time you do something, you come back to this. You're publishing new content. You think about how you connect with people. You add in anything that new and different is happening within your business. You then promote your page. And then finally, you need to improve your data. And that's through the insights of what's happening within your business. Facebook's got a little baby brother. It's called Instagram. Now, yes, Instagram is really, really big. Loads of people are on it. Its engagement levels are really high. We know that. But what you must also remember is that within Instagram, it is the same platform in the back end that Facebook uses. So if you connect the two up, you're actually able to get some significant value within that. <clears throat> you can run shopping campaigns, both on Instagram and on Facebook. So if you've got a Facebook store, you can connect it up with your Instagram and you can actually then drive value across both brands. Run Instagram ads. So when you set up your ads on Facebook, you can actually cross promote them onto your Instagram account as well. Efficiency. Now efficiency is very important because if you think about how much you're actually going in, how much traffic you're going to be generating, how much content you're going to be producing, all of this is very, very important so that you can actually then promote it across both platforms from a single environment, which means you don't have to go into two different areas. So you're talking about conversations, replying to messages. It allows you to focus the activity that you're doing. Think business contact information. One of the worst things you can do is to have conflicting evidence of your, of your business on the same platform. Well, on Facebook and on business, you only have to enter it once. Um, and then all of a sudden it goes out onto Instagram as well, which is fantastic. Gain access to cross-app tools. By linking Facebook and Instagram, you can access other tools like donation sticking, um, camera effects, booking options, which is all built into the platform. What that means is connect the two up and then you get a whole load of benefits just because Facebook wants you to do that. Now, before you go off and start doing all this stuff, it sounds really simple. I urge you that you will not apply you will not do anything until you have applied best practice. So that means you need to research and read. So to help you, to get you started, we're gonna go through 14 steps very, very quickly in terms of what are the best practices around Facebook pages. One, don't create a personal profile for your business. You might actually be in breach of Facebook policy. What this means is <clears throat> your business is its own entity. You are your own entity in, in Facebook size. So when you actually produce a profile, it has to be a business profile, so in other words, a Facebook page. Minimize obvious errors, like posting a picture of your cat. And here we've got our little cat. Don't put it up on your Facebook page. Unfortunately, it's not relevant. It might get a couple of likes. You might get some conversation going, but it's not gonna be relevant. It doesn't matter how cute you think he or she might be. Add a recognizable profile picture. We mentioned that already. Make sure you it is branded, make sure it is respective and reflective of exactly what is happening in your brand as well. Right, engagement. So your cover photo is the opportunity, you have an opportunity here to produce something for your cover photo, which sits within your brand, but it can be just a little bit outside of it. Have something that's perhaps engaging that makes people smile or laugh or, or people get some value out of it. Call to action, I already mentioned that. It's all about call to action. You have a really clear button on your Facebook page, which you can actually say, right, go to our website, landing page, buy something from me, give me a call. You have that opportunity, which is fantastic. 
71% of people that come to a business page for the very first time, they go to the about section. That's a huge number if you think about it. Now, if you're able to actually get a lot of value out of this, you are more likely to engage with that agency or with that company or with that store or whoever it is that you actually provide. You as a business, you must provide a short and specific description. Give them your mission. Give them some information. Tell them about your story. If 71% of people are going to go to it, then they need to get some value out of it as well. What to post? Videos. Videos come first. Facebook wants to be the, def the def default platform for videos moving forward. So that means Facebook is competing with YouTube. Now, are they winning? Don't know. Separate conversation. But right now, Facebook, on average, should automatically get 40% more, sorry, 40 times more shares than photos do. And what that means is Facebook is automatically promoting and pushing your videos forward out of the organic environment so that you get more value out of it. Because Facebook wants you to spend more time on their platform watching more videos rather than just looking at and liking a photograph, which you can do on Instagram. When do you post and how many times a day? It's a very difficult question to answer, but Facebook helps you. It gives you lots of insight in terms of what, when people are online, what they do, where they go, what they like, what they don't like, what they're commenting. Use the Facebook page insight section to get that information out, understand when people are online, and then you can actually appropriately approach people at the time when they're online. In terms of frequency, it depends on your business. I would usually say you have to be online at least once or three times a day. Um, outside of that, you, know, you, you can vary it and you can mold it depending on what you want. Facebook provides a lot of tools. You can actually target people, you can target users, you can look at relationships, educational statuses, location, gender, etc. You can actually put segmentation on your organic posts. It doesn't, it's not all about targeted stuff. Uh, sorry, ad stuff. You can actually target individual posts as well, which is absolutely amazing. When you've got something very important, make sure you stick it to the top. What I mean by that is put the post out and then follow. Facebook makes it really easy to you know, edit the there are three buttons on the right hand side of each post. You just hit that and you post pin it to the top. That means no matter what other things are being posted on, you're actually able to make sure that everyone gets to see that no matter what happens. Decide whether you want Facebook fans to message you privately. Facebook Messenger, it's huge now, right? Everyone is using that. Personally, I would say that you should be using Facebook Messenger because if people are on Facebook, they may want to converse with you on Facebook. You can do it on your mobile phone. You can do it on desktop. It's really easy. And both Instagram and Facebook are combined within one environment, which is excellent. Make sure you respond to comments. The worst thing you can do is ignore people. If you think about when you've gone onto a company page and you've posted something up and that company doesn't respond to you, it's the worst thing that they can do. So that means you have to monitor the activity as your community grows, as you get more likes and more comments, make sure you respond to every single one. If you ignore them, then how will they feel about your company? Have a think about that. Keep it short and sweet. The average attention span is now seven seconds when it comes to online. That's one second less than a goldfish. People are inundated with information, ads, news, content, images, videos. It constantly goes round and round and round in circles. So you have to capture their attention very, very quickly. Know your target audience. So as I said previously, look at the insights, but more so understand who your target market is for your business. If you don't know your target market, stop. Take a step back. Who do you want to engage with? Why do you want to engage with them? What do you want them to say? What do they want to hear from you? And then use Facebook as a platform to actually drive that story forward. And the final and the most important one, engagement. Like, share, tweet, comment, follow, engage. Go out into Facebook. Act as your business in Facebook. And then you can actually provide value, get conversations running, drive people back to your business, drive people back to your Facebook. There's hundreds of groups out there. There's hundreds of pages that are related directly to your business. People are already going to be there having that conversation. Right, let's move on to Facebook groups. Let's do this nice and quickly. 
Facebook group are spaces on the Facebook social network where friends and acquaintances who have similar interests and topics they want to talk about can come together. Facebook groups is actually more of an organic product, which means that it's there to cultivate a conversation. You as a business, what you can do is that you can cultivate awareness of your business and then create conversations, create awareness of specific topics inside and around your, top, your, your company. So if there's something about your industry or something that's happening within your market, you can actually create a group around that and then start a conversation. Some people say, but hold on, can't you do that on Facebook pages? Absolutely, of course you can. But the difference between Facebook pages and Facebook groups is that a Facebook page is your company representation. Do you want people to be having these conversations that are not directly related to your business, but it's your community? So although you can do all of this within the Facebook environment, a Facebook group actually allows you to take that step one step further. So it's a place for fans, customers, and readers to bond around how much they love you, for example. They can actually have discussions that are related to the industry, to the topic, and they can actually then come together and then start to create subgroups within that. And you as a curator of that community is part of it. It's a place to encourage conversations. You can actually create rooms, you can create watch parties, you can actually have all, all these other elements within a Facebook group that you can't have within a Facebook page. So there are specific tools and technologies that are actually provided by Facebook that makes it more meaningful. Public, private, or secret? Okay, it's up to you how you want to do it. There are reasons to make them private, and there are reasons to make them completely public. It's, it, it, it does depend on your strategy. I missed one, super fan. Now, what that, what that means is a super fan can actually go and create a group about you. You can't stop them, but they can't create a page about you because only a company representation represent, representative can actually produce a Facebook page. So if someone creates a group about you, then they're actually showing you that they either they love you loads or they really hate you. But hopefully it's the one that they love you and it's an opportunity for you to go in and actually have meaningful conversations with them. Groups focus on a loyal and authentic online community. Generally, you're only gonna join a group if you believe in what that topic is about. If you're not part of that, then you're not probably not gonna be in the group or you're not gonna be active and you're gonna drop out. So Facebook groups do provide additional value outside of what Facebook pages does by itself. Three main big benefits to Facebook groups. At the top, I say it's a direct line to customers. As I said, it is probably your low customers or fans that are there. They're spending their free time talking and thinking about your business. So you actually have a direct line to them. If you have that opportunity to talk to them, then why not take it? Why not have that opportunity with them to open up a conversation, share special things with them, which then leads on to building long lasting relationships. Customers are loyal to companies that treat them well. What I mean by that is if you think about if a company has given you some value outside of just the basic element of what you're going to them for, you're more likely to talk about them positively. You're more likely to give them loyalty and your trust, which then means that you're going to have a better relationship with them moving forward. Organic reach. Facebook is designed to prioritize content from groups that have high levels of engagement. So the more active your group is, the more posting and more engagement there is happening, Facebook will, will naturally push your content, and push your group forward and share it with other people who might find it relevant. Basically means you grow your community, you grow your brand and your business grows. How do you create your Facebook group? It's actually unbelievably easy, but you must create it as your brand rather than as an individual. That means you stay as a moderator as your business, but you can add yourself in later on. You simply go, <clears throat> click pages in the left menu and select your page. Once you've done that, you go to the groups tab and you create a group. That's literally it. Once you've done that, you can then add photographs, descriptions, and you know, the rules and regulations around that. It's very, very, very easy. Again, once you've done that, what do you do? You're actually there for a different reason. So there's, this is just five main things that I talk about, but you can do so much more with Facebook groups. As a community support um, environment, you can actually have people 
being supported? So is it a customer service environment, for example, or are you this, there to support the community in conversations? Are you there to actually provide value to them in terms of additional stuff that they can't find on your page or in other social environments? A learning and engagement tool. This is a really good one. So I'm sure there's lots of people on this call, on this call right now that are part of a group that has units, that has some form of education piece around it. So you can actually utilize Facebook groups and create it a learning environment. So you get people to go through a course. What does that mean? If you've actually got a course and you're pushing something through, you're then able to generate a revenue stream. Now there's different ways to do this. I wouldn't recommend that you do it from the offset. You wanna grow the group, you wanna show value, <coughs> curate that really, really well, very carefully, very targeted. And then later on down the line, you can then start to monetize in different ways. And there's lots of different strategies that you can use to actually do this. Just like Facebook pages, Facebook groups has insights. It's the same, it's similar data in terms of who is on there, what their likes are, what their dislikes are, how they interact with your content, what they do and where. Use that data, understand what's happening, and then basically improve your content, improve your page through the data so you give them what they want. So your group then becomes an invariable source, invaluable source rather, sorry, of first-hand data that only you can provide within that community. That means you get more loyalty. Right, let's go, go through a couple of tips very, very quickly. Right, rules. Facebook groups should always have rules. In a Facebook page environment, you don't have rules because it's a loyalty page, so people come in and like it. But in a group, people are actually engaging, they're conversing with you, they're having a conversation, they'll be talking to each other. So that means you should set some do's and don'ts when you first start the group. This then allows you to control and manage the group in a far more controlled manner further down the line. Consistency is absolutely key. You have to be regular. Plan your post in advance. Don't do it on a whim. So don't think, oh, I haven't, I've been quiet in the group for three days. I should probably go in and say something. That's the wrong way to do it. Have a content plan. Have a content calendar. What are you going to be talking about? What are you going to be discussing? What do people want to hear from you? <clears throat> what, do people, what are people talking about? What conversations have they started that you are, go are going to go in and actually drive that conversation? So in other words, spark the conversation if the community is not doing it on your behalf. Welcome posts. Every Monday, you must welcome new people. And every single Monday, reintroduce yourself. Obviously, if no one's joined the group in the last seven days, you can skip it. But if there are new people joining, please go and introduce yourself. It's only polite. Engage, but not all the time. You're a moderator. It's not your community. It's their community. You're just there to steer things a little bit. You're just there to push things around a little bit and just to give them a little bit of value. So in other words, let them have the conversation. Let conversations flow. Don't, you don't have to go in and start saying, stop talking about this or why is everyone quiet? You can actually just go in and just say, hey, I'm here. It's been two days. I'm going to post something. That's okay. Just like the Facebook pages, post when the group is busy. Use the analytical data. Learn when your community is online and be online at the same time. If it's in the evening, which where a lot of businesses actually find that, around sort of six o'clock, nine o'clock, that's perfectly fine. Be online at that time. Basically means you're going to be working in the evening. Engage with them when they're ready, not when you're ready. Remember, it's your community. It's your business. They want to speak to you on their terms in this situation. How do you get engagement, though? There's lots of things that you can do. And one of the best things in groups is events. So AMA sessions, which is Ask Me Anything, where you can actually have a community member come on and say they're going to run this or they're actually, they can actually be the person that gets interviewed. You can also then have an industry expert. Or if you really want to, you can have your own CEO or your, another C-level person can come in and actually run a Q&A session from someone within the business. Talks and panels, mastermind sessions, or community discussions, they're all very, very important because it, it gets people talking around specific topics. It gets people thinking about what to do and how to do it. And then the final, final one is a casual get to know each other. That's basically create, you can create sub environments, sub rooms, encourage people to break off, create a Facebook messenger group where people can actually go up and talk about specific topics if they want to. 
Moving on. Right. Absolutely no bots. This is a human-only environment. Don't automate your Facebook group. You must do it organically. Otherwise, you lose the point of what a Facebook group is. You are there to provide value and real conversation. Do not automate it. Remove your trolls. There's always going to be people who moan and complain. Remove them. It's okay. You don't want them dragging down the overall feel of that positive environment that you've got. But always follow the rules. So if someone's not breaking rules and they're just having a moan, have a chat with them privately. Or if they are breaking rules, get rid of them. Growth. Invite people from other channels. Cross-promote your group and then sell it as an add-on, perhaps as a VIP group, for example. Lots of companies do that. If you work with us, if you buy this product, you then get access to this really special curated group that we've actually got together. And that brings it some value automatically. People are like, hmm, I wonder what's in this group. I wouldn't mind being part of this. And finally, don't forget about it. So many times people have started a group and then they come back about a year later. They're like, hey, I forgot about this. And there's 30 people in here or 3,000 people in here. What do I do with it? Don't forget about it. Make it part of your strategy. Make sure that you actually are consistent. You are regular. It's part of your marketing strategy. Right, moving very swiftly on to Facebook ads. We're doing great for time here. What are Facebook ads? Facebook ads are designed to achieve three main things. Your business, awareness, consideration, and then a conversion. A conversion is a sale or a purchase or a sign up, whatever you regard as when someone is transacting with your business. The awareness piece is very, very good on Facebook. It's very easy to do. Facebook loves Facebook ads for awareness simply because it makes them a whole load of money. Um, you can burn through your budget very quickly. Be very careful with just doing an awareness campaign. But if you do it in conjunction with a retargeting campaign and in conjunction with a conversion campaign, then it's very, very efficient and works very well. The consideration is how do you get people to go from the ad directly to your website. So they can bypass Facebook pages and Facebook groups. So you're basically using Facebook data and the Facebook platform to target people and then drive them to your website. The great way to do it, it basically means that you can get people to do things like buy your product, sign up with you, um, install your app, whatever it may be that you actually decide is a consideration element. There's lots of different types of ads on Facebook and on Instagram, obviously. I've only got three examples here for you. Um, you've all seen these, they're all in your news feed. You'll see them on the right-hand side of Facebook pages um, when you're actually navigating around. You're being targeted based on Facebook data. Now, some of these are good, some of these are not. It's up to you. It's very, very personal. But just remember one thing, be very clear. Focus on three things. You have a story, you have a hook, and then you have an offer. If you don't have those three things, then your Facebook ad is not going to be very efficient for you. But why should you be using Facebook ads? I talk about 11 main things here. There's a, there are other reasons, and it's different for every business. So what I talk about mainly, the number one thing is you get lots of data about your community and your target market. But outside of Facebook pages insights or Facebook group insights, Facebook ads gives you loads of information about the target market. So the people who see your ad, where do they see it? What platform were they on? What time of day was it? What age range are they in? What are their demographics? It gives you loads of information, which allows you to mold and change your strategy moving forward. Micro-target your audience. So when you set up Facebook ads, don't go after millions and millions of people. Make it so specific and so relevant that your conversion rate is going to be so high because the people who see that ad is a small number of people they're super engaged with it. It's so relevant to them that they're like, I have to click on this. As I said, micro-target. So number three is you create ads to match your specific objective. Great. You'll reach more people than organic posts. Of course, we all know this. Facebook started downweighting organic posts a little while ago. They want you to spend money on their platform. <clears throat> so it basically means if you want to grow your Facebook platform exponentially very quickly, 
I'm going to have to put budget behind it, and start running ads, and drive people back. <clears throat> and then you've got micro, with micro targeting, you get clicks and conversions for a low cost. What I mean by that is if you micro target, that puts you in a position where there's less competition around you. But if there's fewer people competing with you, you spend less money. So, in other words, don't do one huge campaign, do 10 micro campaigns with the same budget, and you'll suddenly find that the, the click through rates, the conversion rates are very, very high, the cost per acquisition on each one is very low, and you'll get a whole lot of data for each of the micro communities, which you can then create pages on your website to target these individual people, giving them specific map value. Lisa, you're saying, what do you mean by micro targeting? What I mean by that is, if depending on which sector you're in, <clears throat> you can go after either the entire sector or you can find sections within that industry to target. So for example, I'm in the digital marketing industry. I can say, this is uh, an ad for everyone who is interested in digital marketing. Okay, but I can then create that into micro sections. How to grow your business for, for coaches or coaches in London who want to grow their business on Facebook ads. All of a sudden, I'm, my, I'm segmenting the market and creating micro targets within the overarching industry. Hopefully that helps, Lisa. Um, where were we? Easy to find B2B leads. A bit more expensive than B2C. B2B is always more expensive. The reason why it's more expensive is because these platforms, just like LinkedIn and Twitter, they all know that a business lead, although it takes longer to turn into a client, it puts you in a position where you're more likely to get higher value, so people are willing to pay more for a B2B lead than they are for a B2C lead. Uh, Anna says, is anyone else hearing from the computer or just the phone? Don't know, Anna, sorry. <laughs> um, Understand that if you're in the B2B environment, the cost per acquisition is going to be a little bit higher. That's okay. Just understand that your process for data analysis needs to be far tighter. You need to understand the insights in a much closer manner so that you can actually then get all of the value out of the B2B environment. Anna, will we get these slides later? Yes, I'm recording this. It'll go up on YouTube, so you'll all have access to it. Then we've got, people spend a lot of time on Facebook, so you have a wide audience. Of course they do. We already know that 60% of the internet world is on Facebook. So it doesn't get much larger than that. What you can do is understand the insights, use ads to target people in a very intelligent manner, very micro-target them, and all of a sudden you're going to get huge masses of value. Scale your content promotion. You can boost your content on Facebook. Target it to the people that want to see that content. Get the insights from your community and then target the, the people outside of the community to grow your community. That's content promotion. Ads can encourage customer loyalty. A customer that sees ads as well as sees your content, knows about your brand, knows about your website. There's a seven touch rule. If a, comp if a person sees your business or your brand seven times, they're more likely to buy from you. I think it's something like three times more likely to buy from you. So, if ads is one of them, you can target them very tightly. Right, your strategy. This is a really difficult one to do because every single business is completely different. However, generically speaking, what are the products or services that you're promoting? Who are you targeting? Are you going after a cold audience or a warm audience? What I mean by cold and warm is how likely are they to buy from you based on have they ever heard of you before or, have they, or are they further down the, the journey so they actually are aware of your brand, aware of your services, aware, aware of your products, so a little bit warmer to you. How will they use the product? Can you actually talk about what the product is, how it works, where it fits into their life, and where it brings them value? Because you need to talk about that within your ad. What is their pain point and what are their objective, uh, sorry, objections? What, that, what I mean by that is you need to address their pain points in order for them to, to click on the ad. Or if you can address some of the questions and queries they've got in advance, before they even start speaking to you, you can then get a higher click-through rate on your ads. Which stage of the funnel are they in? Funnel is an interesting word because it's not linear. P 
people go round and round up and down in funnels all the time. There's, a, there's another funnel model that I have, which I don't talk about in this presentation, but I'll be talking about it next week, is the funnel process for Facebook ads is understand at which stage is your consumer in. Is it awareness, is it consideration, or is it the purchase point? So you then need to give them the appropriate information in the ad, driving them through, through to the right landing page, which then gives them the right value. And then finally, what, why are you running ads? What is the objective? Is it leads, brand awareness, sales? Are you trying to get site traffic? Do you want to get people to download your app? Is it to start a conversation? What is your overarching objective? Once you know number eight, you can then go back and build everything around one through seven to make sure you drive that forward really, really, really well. Within the environment, <coughs> when you set up a Facebook account, sorry, Facebook ad account, there's three marketing objectives that we've talked about, and that, this is an actual screenshot from the Facebook ad system. <coughs> it's important to choose the right one because Facebook then optimizes the ads for you based on what you pick. So you must understand what your campaign objective is, otherwise it doesn't work very well. <coughs> the right objective ultimately lowers your cost per click. If you micro-target your community, if you micro-target the ads, and you get the objective right, your cost per click is gonna come right down, and then you select an objective that aligns with your goals, and then you grow your business. <coughs> Within the audience targeting, this, when you first look at it, it you, you're going to think, wow, it's so complicated, it's really difficult. Don't worry about it. Take your time. Go through the options one step at a time. If you look at everything in all in one go, it's very overwhelming, especially if you're doing this for the first time. But ultimately, you've got different options. But everything from language, gender, age range, where they're located, once you've got these basic things in, you then get an audience size, and then you get the estimated daily reach based on what the reach is and how much your budget is. So then you get an idea of what you should be expecting for your business. Down at the bottom on the left, you've got detailed targeting. This is where you enter in the interests or the behaviors of the people that you want to target. So what are they like? What position are they in? What do they talk about? Which groups are they part of? Which pages do they like? If you really want to, enter in your competitor's brand name target their community, and then you can drive them into your community. Great. Right. Once you've got everything set up, you will have set up something called a Facebook pixel on your website. Now, I'm not talking about Facebook pixels in this particular presentation, but the important thing is, is that once you've got your pixel set up, you can do custom audiences and then lookalike audiences based on your pixel data. We can talk about pixel data after this if anybody wants to, that's not a problem. But fundamentally, this section here is all about micro-targeting. It's about driving value that is not outside of your really your core environment. It's very, very important. What types of ads? Right. Photo ads, video ads, story ads, messenger ads, slides ads, slideshow ads. There's going to be new ones coming out within the next year as well. So keep an eye on that. But before you just go in and start launching ads, you must understand what type of ad you want to run. Because depending on the type of ad you want to run, you have to then produce different content. So this one here from Audi is a simple image with some text. And then it just says, learn more about this car. All right. So it's basically a photo ad. So they're using one image. Now, if you use up to 10, you can actually set up a slideshow, which then gives you motion, sound, and text if you want it. Messenger ads are designed to be conversation starters. They're going to appear within messenger environments. It's going to drive people to have a conversation, to talk to you about something. So, so again, going back to what is your campaign objective? Video. As I said earlier on, video content is what Facebook pushes organically. It has a much higher conversion rate, it has a much higher click-through rate, it basically means it's much easier to convey your story and then Facebook will promote it for you without you having to spend a whole load of money. Add locations. Now, I don't mean physical locations around the globe. What I mean by location is because Facebook has got such a big range of environments that you can actually put your ads out, everything from the messenger, the audience network, 
Instagram, and then Facebook itself. Within the Facebook app, you're a little bit more limited, obviously, but that's okay if you're targeting Facebook people on mobile. So if you're a mobile app, for example, just do mobile ads. Don't do desktop ads. It doesn't make sense. Devices. Is it on uh, iOS? Is it on Android? Is it on tablet? Is it on desktop? Pick your strategy, pick your campaign structure and focus it based on the technology that you know your people are going to be using. Multiple options on Facebook and Instagram. I would say if you've never done this before, start on all of them and then look at the data and then track back. So you can pull out the sections that don't work too well, upweight the people, the sections that are working very, very well, and then you can drive that forward. The Facebook audience network. A lot of people don't know what the Facebook audience network is, but it's actually an environment where app owners have agreed with Facebook to accept Facebook ads. So in other words, you can use Facebook to target people outside of Facebook, but only within apps. And that's both on Android and on iOS. What you need to think about is where are your users? The people that you're speaking to and, you're, and you want to capture, what platform are they on? Where do they go? Is it mobile? Is it desktop? Have that knowledge and information first up front, and then start launching your ads. This is up to you how much you want to spend. I can't tell you this, but use some basic, simple logic. Don't throw all the money in at once because Facebook will just go, oh, thank you very much. I'll have all of that. What you need to do is that you need to have a test budget. Go in slowly. Start off with maybe 50 pounds or $50 or whichever currency you're in and scale it slowly over time so that you don't waste a whole lot of money. Get data in. Understand allocated daily spend so you don't spend too much and pace it slowly over the campaign. That, this thing gives you data which allows you to optimize and then you can then go large once you've actually then got the right target market sorted out. Optimization tips. It's very dependent on what results you're getting. Depending on the results that you get, it then gives you different optimization options. But the first and the most obvious one is social proof. If you don't know what social proof is, it's when people like and comment on your Facebook ads. What I mean by this is that when someone puts out a Facebook post, be it on a page or a group or your personal profile, a number of people engage with it by liking it or commenting on it. In essence, that's social proof from Facebook's perspective. If you've got lots of social proof on your ads, and now you can share your ads with your friends and your family by grabbing the link from the ad center, you can actually then get social proof against it and engage on a higher level from the Facebook system. Every time you make a change, and what I mean by a change is a major change, focusing on how have you changed the structure of the business, of the ads, of the account, have you changed the URL, something like that, not a punctuation change. You have to wait 24 hours for the system to recognize the change, approve it, and then your ads will go live again. You then need to wait for the ads to collect data before you start making changes, but be patient with it. Don't go in and think, right, 24 hours have gone by, I can start changing. Optimize ad placement based on which one is performing best. Now, this is true of basically everything when you're running ads anywhere in the world. So if you're doing Facebook ads, which locations, both geography and within the system, do you have to optimize against? Which ones do you get the highest click-through rates? Which one is the lowest cost? Which one is ge generating the most value for your business, i.e., where are you getting your conversions from? Remove people that have already converted. And number eight, what I mean here is, Facebook gives you the ability to remove people who have achieved your goal for that ad. In other words, you never have to retarget these people again because you've already got them as a customer. Always use inbuilt Facebook automation rules. Facebook doesn't like automation outside of their platform, but within the platform, absolutely go for broke. Make sure you look at all of the tools that they actually provide. There are a number of them, everything from um, day parting, so when your ad should be going live, when it should be online, as well as optimizing based on, sorry, optimizing your budget based on where people are and what people do. 
Finally, don't be a sheep. Think about things differently. Create your own identity. If you don't create your own identity, you will find yourself in a situation that you're doing exactly what the competition's doing. So you're then no different from anyone else. Once you've got all that together, go ahead and launch. Thank you. If you've got any questions, feel free to come off mute and you can have a conversation now with me. That was brilliant. Thank you very much. Do you uh -huh. use the same technique for a service instead of a product? Sorry, say that again? If you have a service, would you do a Facebook page and would you follow the same um, process you've just outlined? Yes, absolutely. The process doesn't change. It's exactly the same. Um, if you think of it as you're providing a product or a service in the online environment, in terms of promoting it and putting descriptions in, putting your brand in, creating the profile page for your business, it's always going to be the same thing. It doesn't change from that perspective. And do you invite your competition? Um, they'll find you, don't worry. That's the easy part. <laughs> Thanks, Marie. Any more questions from anyone? Is there anything in the chat? Let's have a look. Uh, okay, no, no questions. Great, so that means that everyone understands everything. Um, that's always a good thing. I'll stay online for a few more minutes if anybody wants to ask any questions, but otherwise I will be uploading this up onto YouTube um, and, if, and I will then share the link out with everyone on this, on this chat um, as well as everyone who signed up. Thanks, Hashem. Great. Thanks, guys. That was brilliant. Thank you very much. You're welcome, Marie. Thank you. Cheers, my name. Take care. You're welcome, guys. Thanks for the messages. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Mark. Ah, is the digital analyst still online? If you are, feel free to come off of mute. If you are, then I can answer your question. I'm really sorry. I only just saw it now. Oh, my microphone won't work. Okay, so you're asking... Uh, I have a GDPR related question. My team are trying to set up custom audience ads in Facebook in a regulated industry that is very hard risk adverse. How do we find out where the data is stored by Facebook once uploaded, i.e. within EU, not the US? And also, can we find out whether Facebook employees in the US can access this data? So Facebook actually has data houses across the globe. Um, I would have to have a look at your Facebook account um, and we can have a conversation with your Facebook ad manager or your Facebook account manager in terms of where the data is actually being housed. Um, it's very difficult for me to say where it is based on where your business is. If generally, if you're in the U EU environment, then you'll be stored within the EU. Um, but if you have US customers, there's a good chance that your data will actually be held within the US as well. Hopefully that answers your question, but feel, we can have a conversation about this later on if you want to, it's not a problem. Right. Uh, Zishan, can you hear me? Hi, who's that? Hi, it's Richard. Um, my camera's not on, but um, if you don't mind, I'd like to ask two questions. Please, go um, ahead. So, first of all, in terms of scalability, in terms of like digital campaigns and ads, I know Facebook is huge, but who's like the next runner up? Like who's, who's the next competition or you know, big in terms of scale. And the second question is like, how much are like the average campaign costs to run ads on Facebook? Because I okay. heard people sure. saying that it, it, it could be sometimes costly too. Yeah, it absolutely can. So, okay, so first question was, um, if you're using Facebook to scale, that's one way to do it. What's the next one to do? Google Ads, uh, Google Paid Search, it's, a huge platform. It's actually larger than Facebook ads. Is it any, I mean, okay, sorry, 
if I were to kind of switch the question a little bit, like what are the big difference between Facebook ads and Google ads from so, the user point of view? So from a user's perspective, a social environment is different. So you're actually being pushed an ad out onto you in Facebook. So Facebook is very mm. much push marketing. So as you're going through Facebook pages, you'll see an ad. Now you haven't asked to see that ad, you're just being targeted. I so Google I search is different. You're gonna go into Google search and then you're gonna run a search and then you're asking a question. You're asking to find out about other information. So that's called pull marketing, where people are pulling ads towards themselves. So mm. depending on your strategy as a consumer and then you as a business, depending on your strategy, you can use both push and pull. Now this comes from the, from, the, from the old days of when you used to be walking down the street and you'd see a big billboard ad. You have right. to see that ad whether you want to or not. Right. And then there is, right. can you send me this information, please? Just like Google search, I want to see this information so you're pulling it towards yourself. Right. If right. you're asking about the next big, big, pers big platform for advertising in social, you've then got, obviously got Facebook, Instagram as one which is huge within the social environment. Now, if you're a B2B business, um, then it's LinkedIn. You need to be on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. It's a hugely important platform. Um, I think there's something like uh, 600 million accounts on uh, LinkedIn now, and they're constantly growing. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't like LinkedIn, if you're more of a B2C, then focus on Instagram, uh, sorry, focus on Facebook and Instagram, and then add in Twitter campaigns on a social perspective, which you can do. So you can do uh, promoted tweets um, right. based around specific topics. It is very much dependent on what your business is like. But interesting because you, sorry, just to, to add on, like you said, talk, talk, like this um, different kind of marketing style from Facebook ads and Google ads. Well, in terms of effectiveness, you know, in this uh, for B two C campaigns, like how are they different? Like, well, which one's more effective, or is, does it depend on the product? It does massively depend on the product. Um, it depends on which sector you're in. So, mm. and it also depends on your budget levels. And it also then depends on how good you are running Facebook ads and how good you are running a Google search ads. So right. from my perspective, um, if I'm doing a B2C campaign, I'm gonna ask, right, is this product a consumer lifestyle product? If it's a lifestyle product, then social is going to work better. But if it's a, a B2C product, mm -hmm. which is perhaps more functional in my life, like I'm going to buy, I don't know, this case, or I'm going to buy a pen or something like that, then right. Facebook ads will work, but you're more likely to find people searching for that as well. Because it, right. they may not right. be specific. Very very like. specific. Right. Yeah. But it, it, it then works on different levels as well. Right. What was your other questions? I've forgotten. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, campaign cost. Like roughly how much the budget estimate? Okay, I'm going to ask you a question in order to answer this question because obviously every single sector is completely different. Which sector okay. are you in? Um, I am not. I'm not currently having any um, product yet. I'm still considering. I'm trying to decide which product I want to market. Um, Give me one, <laughs> so I can answer your question. <laughs> okay. Um, Thinking more like, like, let's say, um, like T-shirts or like, pre, like how would I put it? Like, um, like own brands, like own products. A little bit like lifestyle driven, like T-shirts, sneakers, um, accessories, those kind of stuff. Okay. Um. So your cost per acquisition around that is not going to be too high. It's a B two C environment. Um. Mm -hmm. It's low value product and by that i don't mean any disrespect i simply mean low value in no, terms okay. of the cost compared to selling a laptop for example um right so your cost per acquisition there generally on facebook is going to be lower once you've done mm -hmm. good optimization if you follow the micro community targeting micro sectioning of the sectors you will then find yourself in a position that you will actually drive your cost way down um Facebook is great for that simply because you can actually showcase your products as well. So if you've got right. t-shirts, you can target the people. So women's t-shirts for under 13, you can target under 13 year olds, sorry, beg your pardon, not under 13, over 13 um, mm -hmm. on Facebook from a demographic perspective. Whereas on 
paid search, you're then going to type in um, young girls t-shirts and then what type of mm -hmm. t-shirt. So the targeting on Facebook is easier from this perspective because you get demographic data and geographic data and then interest and behavior. Whereas on face right. on Google uh, search, you're then going after keywords. So what are people searching? Traditionally, paid search is more expensive in this environment, probably by about between 8 and 12%. Um, mm -hmm. You can drive that down depending on your strategy and how you structure things. Um, but Facebook, I would recommend, is generally going to be cheaper for you. Okay. So, I mean, just, just as a, let's say, like, if I have, like, a couple of influencers who want to sell their own, like, design T-shirts and stuff, um, you know, like collaborations, collaborated t-shirts and accessories and fashion items and stuff. If you were to like run a campaign ad, let's say for an influencer and her or his like own brands on Facebook, like yep. how much should it roughly be to run campaign ads for about a year? Um, it depends how much people you want to capture. So what's your goal? How much, what do you want to achieve? Um, yeah. it, just on that information alone, it's impossible to give you a number because Understood. there's going to be a number of people that are out there that you can approach based on your right. geography, right. based on the demographics, based on targeting. That Once you've got that data, I can then say to you, right, Richard, you've got this many people, you mm -hmm. can capture this many people with this much budget. Um, mm -hmm. If I was to no, say that you're a yeah. decent sized business, yes. uh, I'll then say spend like £100 a day or $100 a day, which then gives you a whole lot of data and information coming in which you can then use to optimize and then drive the cost per acquisition down by filtering out irrelevant sections. So right. over a course of a year, I mean, you, you could in theory spend hundreds of thousands of pounds of dollars on Facebook very easily. Um, mm. I would only recommend you do that once you've done huge amounts of testing, you've got loads of optimization done, you understand the data extremely well, and you know your conversion rate is nice and high. So that when you do scale, you scale right. A way that drives you high levels of value rather than scaling in the beginning. Right. On this it makes perfect sense. Okay. Cool. Thank you so much. No worries. Thanks for getting involved. Is there anyone else who's got any questions? That's quiet. If not, then we'll call it a day, I think. All right, well, thank you very much for joining everyone. I hope you found it helpful and useful. Um, I'll be back online next week talking about some other bits and pieces, mainly around LinkedIn marketing next week. We'll hopefully see you there. Thanks, Lisa. All right, guys, take care.